grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Part of God's word for our consideration this day is our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. A certain one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. Jesus entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Just then a sinful woman from that town learned that he was reclining in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume, stood behind him near his feet, weeping, and began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she began to wipe them with her hair while also kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would realize who is touching him and what kind of woman she is because she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. He said, teacher, say it. A certain moneylender had two debtors. The one owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they could not pay, he forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one who had the larger debt forgiven. Then he told him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, but you did not give me water for my feet. Yet she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but she, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore I tell you, for many sins have been forgiven. That is why she loves so much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those reclining at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the gospel good news of our Lord. Dear friends in Christ, let's make America great again. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's, that's not it. It was actually first stated by a Wisconsin senator, Alexander Wiley, in 1940 when he was trying to help Wendell Wilkie beat FDR for the presidency. Yeah, we remember it probably more from the 1980s. 1980, to be more specific, Ronald Reagan used that as his slogan when he was campaigning for president. But before him, Barry Goldwater had used it in his campaign, and after him, Bill Clinton used it in all his speeches before he was running the first time. Even Hillary used it for her first cam campaign slogan when she ran the first time. It wasn't a matter of controversy, however, until Donald Trump trademarked it and used it in his presidential campaign, and then it became, I guess, something of a pop culture phenomenon. And now, since that time, well, it was in the middle of that whole Jesse Smollett hate crime hoax, wasn't it? And uh, in response to it, I know at least Andrew Cuomo and Eric Holden have gone on record saying, well, America never was really that good or that great. And different media personalities will tell us it has become a dog whistle or racist code. Great. Great. It's like when my... Little son, I don't know how old he was, just a little toddler, meeting his great-grandmother for the very first time. And fortunately, he waited till the end of when we were coming outside before he said, so what's so great about her? Great. Great. We know the sportscasters like to use that. Great. And okay, that would be all right if they didn't keep on using it until it just really got on our nerves. Because really, if it's that great, would they have to say the same thing like 15 or 20 times in one baseball game? If so-called greatness happens that often, it doesn't really stand out. It's just, just something average, right? Shouldn't something be great be something that really stands out? On the other side, there are things that have achieved greatness, but it's not always recognized or noticed or affirmed. For example, I probably couldn't tell you the difference between a truly great wine and a just plain old average wine. And I know for sure I could not tell you the difference between a great performance in ballet and a poor performance in ballet. It's just not something that, that matters to me or interests to me or seems to concern me enough. And, and so maybe that's why I don't appreciate it enough to be able to set apart what is truly great. 
But this morning, our Lord Jesus sets something in front of us that does concern us, that does interest us, this, this topic of God's God's love, and, and when he talks about, when he's saying great, this is no way an exaggeration. In fact, this is the understatement of all time as he invites us to recognize the greatness of God's love. And he lets us know that to do that, to recognize the greatness of God's love, we first have to recognize the greatness of our debt and the greatness of the payment that was made, and then great appreciation is going to follow. The first step However, in recognizing this greatness of God's love is to recognize how great our debt was. See, contrary to popular opinion, God's not this kind of of out-of-the-loop, senile old guy sitting up there that if he does notice sin, he kind of just winks at it and lets it go by. Oh, boys will be boys. Sinners will be sinners. No, the one true God who created everything and everyone demands absolute perfection and holiness just like he is absolutely perfect and holy. And not just expects it, but demands it. And has those demands written down for us in his holy law, in his word, in, in black and white. And these are commandments, not suggestions or wishes. And he lets us know very seriously that anything less than this is a violation of his holiness, of his majesty, and requires punishment. Now, we have difficulty even kind of imagining this type of, of perfect and, and perfection. I, I know, well, if you think of baseball, have you ever heard of something called a perfect game? It's one of the rarer feats that takes place in baseball. And what is that? Where the pitcher pitches through the game and there aren't any runs. There aren't even any hits. There aren't even any walks. Wow, a perfect game. And yet, is it perfect? Or did he throw some pitches that weren't in the strike zone? Did he throw some balls? And did he get maybe a charitable referee or ump or or someone gave him a call here or there? Or maybe there was a pitch off the plate that they called a strike anyways, even when it wasn't. Or maybe there was one that was right over the place, nice and juicy, and it was a mistake, and it probably should have been a home run. But we say it's a perfect game. And that was just one game, just a couple hours this, this, this afternoon, and, and that was just a baseball game. But probably the greatest perfect game was Harvey Haddock's, 1959, 12 and two-thirds innings, a perfect pitching, and he ended up losing the game. And not only that, he lost more games that season than he won, and, and this, is, this, is our, this is our built-in failure rate as human beings for even what we like to consider perfection, but not God. He doesn't have a built-in failure rate. In fact, he can't even tolerate failure. He demands no sins, none, zero. Every every bit of his ledger has to have the holiness column filled up and the sin column absolutely blank for all people. But that's not what my accounts show, and that's not what your accounts show, not even close. Not only are we not perfect in keeping all his commandments, we don't even keep any single one of them perfectly. As his word tells us that every single unkind word or lustful thought or taking advantage of someone else, even our discontent with the lot God has given us in our life, our pride, our selfishness, our greed, that it's all sin and our sin columns are all filled up and there's our holiness, righteousness column sitting there blank and empty because we are all sinners. As God himself tells us in his holy word, there is surely not a righteous person on earth who does good and does not sin. We're all sinners. The only difference, God's word tells us, is that some people recognize that fact and others do not. For example, the the woman in our text, she's not named here, just says, a sinful woman from the town. Her, Her name might as well have been sinner. Or worse, you can think of your own, but don't say it out loud. There are children here. Her name might have meant been just sinner in that town. Everybody knew it. Jesus knew it. Simon the Pharisee knew it. The whole town knew it. And she herself knew she was a sinner. And that was the difference between her and Simon the Pharisee and the other Pharisees and a whole lot of other people. She knew how great her debt was before God. Simon the Pharisee didn't know Oh, those two people, they had debts that were equally huge. It's just that Simon didn't realize it. He's absolutely oblivious to it. He's one of these people that's really skilled at blaming other people 
or rationalizing the things that he does that are sins. And, and just like me, and maybe sometimes like you, or maybe like that, that one career criminal who's standing there in the courtroom before the judge and the prosecuting attorney, he asks him if, if he has any previous arrests or convictions. And he says, well, yeah, lots of them, of course. And then the lawyer says, so any felonies? And now he's hurt. Now he indignantly, no, sir, I only specialize in misdemeanors. That's us. We specialize in misdemeanors, don't we? The sins that are excusable. The sins that fall into the kind of excusable range or a range of acceptability. But you know who doesn't have a range of acceptability? Yeah, the Lord God, the Holy God himself. And he says that means that we're in deep trouble. Now these two guys Jesus is talking about, one owes 50 denarii, that's about two months wages. 500 is two years wages. They both had pretty big debts, but probably for either of them, the punishment was going to be some time in debtor's prison or maybe even slavery temporarily. For us, the punishment's a lot steeper. God's word says, cursed is everyone who does not continually do everything written in the book of the law. Cursed, that's that, that eternal condemnation. That is a big debt. But as big as that debt is, the payment was even bigger. Even greater. Those debtors in Jesus' story, they end up not having to pay anything. They're, the creditor lets them off the hook. He cancels their debts. He literally makes a gift of what they owed him. Exactly what Jesus, the Son of God, did with our infinitely greater debt. As God the Son, his whole purpose in coming into human history, into coming into human flesh, into coming into this world as a human being, was to cancel out all of our debt. To get rid of that debt before God, but boy, that would take a huge payment. It would take God the Son, having to give up the use of his glory and power and face Satan and sin and hell and death in our place for us. To live in perfect obedience to God's law and then to sacrifice himself as the only thing that was expensive enough to pay off all our debts to get rid of all those countless marks that we had in the sin column and then to fill up our holiness column with his own perfect righteousness. God made him who did not know sin to become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now like the men who owed the 50 and 500 denarii, our debt has been canceled. Our guilt has been completely sent away to where God never, never sees it again. It'd be like if, if somehow we could shovel all of our sins into these big rockets that we see come off Vandenberg Base here, and instead of being pointed to some polar orbit, this was pointed right at the sun. And this giant rocket with all our sins on it just crashed into the sun, and it's gone, obliviated forever. There's the relief that this woman, Jesus, was talking to. Had. Jesus had come to pay for her sins. Jesus had come to pay for her sins. It really shows Simon the Pharisee's ignorance, doesn't it? When he says, oh, I wonder if Jesus knows. He thinks he's a prophet. Well, shouldn't he know what kind of what a person this is? This, this lady's a sinner. What a clueless man. As Jesus knew exactly who she was. He knew exactly who Simon the Pharisee was too. And he had come to pay for both of their sins. This woman, she knew she needed that. She's way ahead of Simon, wasn't she? When Jesus says, your sins have been forgiven, your faith has saved you, go in peace. She knew Jesus had come to pay for her sins. She knew that Jesus had come to save her. Jesus had come to pay for that Pharisee's sins too. He just didn't, he just didn't know. He didn't think he needed saving. It just didn't do him any good. Jesus paid the debts for absolutely everyone. That's how great his payment was. And of course, for anyone who realizes the greatness of the debt and then the greatness of the payment that got rid of the debt, well, some kind of appreciation is bound to follow, right? I mean, if someone pulled you out of a blazing fire, wouldn't you appreciate it? If someone spared you from certain doom, wouldn't you want to say thank you and be grateful in some way? Someone did. They saved you from this, this free fall into the never-ending fires of hell, and that someone was of course, Jesus. 
know, those who don't realize what their debt was and how great that forgiveness is, of course, they don't understand that. And they don't also, they don't understand the thankful response of God's people. This Simon the Pharisee, he's wondering, he's looking at this lady, what is this, this crazy lady doing? And why is Jesus, if he knows, why is he letting her? But this woman knew that if it were not for Jesus, she was doomed forever. Her appreciation flowed from a heart of faith. It flowed from a place where, where she knew how much her Savior Jesus had done for her. And she wanted to show that she knew that. It didn't bother who, who else was there or what they thought. She just wanted to show her love for Jesus. She didn't let any kind of self-righteous pride get in the way. She wasn't held back by any of that. She just wanted to show love for Jesus. And Jesus explains that to everyone else in the room. He says, therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That is why she loved so much. Not as some people mistakenly taken this, that, that she got forgiven because she loved so much. Oh, no, no, that's not the way Jesus says it. It's the other way around. It's like if I can tell you that, well, I can tell you that it rained because the street is wet. The wet street did not cause it to rain. The wet street is the proof, the result of that rain. And Jesus is saying that forgiveness and her love, that love of hers is a result of that perfect forgiveness of his. As God tells us, we are saved by faith alone. Right, we're saved by faith alone, but that same God also tells us that that faith is never alone. It always has some appreciation. When we realize how great our debt was and how great Jesus' payment was, we can't help but show appreciation. And that explains a lot, doesn't it? It explains why we're here. It explains why, why the Bible so often and so strongly has to say that this salvation thing, this being right with God thing, it doesn't have anything to do with anything that comes from us. It comes all from Him. That's why it's called grace. It's His free and precious gift. That also explains why, why it doesn't necessarily work to legislate morality. That it's not really good when, when the church preaches politics and then the government tries to legislate religion. Neither of those work. Or even when the church thinks that its job is, is to make people's actions better and to make their lives better when really God tells us it's all about giving them his word. Because that's what changes the heart. And of course, if God has someone's heart, he's going to have all the rest of them as well. But most of all, it explains how great God's love really is. That there is nothing greater than that. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Having listened to the word of our holy God, we now have the opportunity to confess the faith he's given us we do that this morning using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Would you please stand as you're able? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.